Good morning. This is Reverend Mike Capron of the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Our text for the day is 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 15. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. This ends our reading. All right, so this is the treasure in clay jars passage. Oh, I love that. Treasure in clay jars. Where is that? Second Corinthians somewhere? Chapter 4? Uh, okay. I don't remember anything else about that part. No one does. That's the problem with a vibrant illustration or, or image. Everyone remembers your illustration or image, treasure in clay jars, and forgets everything else that you say. So let's see if we can review this passage and, and figure out its relevance to us. What are clay jars? Well, they are our bodies. The word body is used three times in this passage. The word death four times. Um... And what are clay jars? They are fragile. Um, some of us have a sense of the fragility of these bodies, our physical health. To those who don't, God bless you. Enjoy youth and health and vigor. Me, I'm just about to turn 60. I can still do most of what I want to do, but I probably have to do less of it. I went up on the roof to my new house this week. It's been decades since I climbed a ladder to a roof. I used to enjoy it. Now I was nervous. I kept thinking about how even a one-story fall could result in broken bones. I felt fragile, and I did not like feeling fragile. I hope I'm not disappointing you by admitting that I felt fragile. I'm in a leadership role, and people don't like their leaders to be fragile. We would all be like to be led by Superman. He's invulnerable to harm, and he can do anything. We can all just sit around and watch him handle all of our problems. You got it, Superman! Good job! Well, we didn't get Superman, and neither did the early church. We got Rabbi Jesus, the carpenter's son who got executed by Romans on the cross. And then we got Peter, the washed-up fisherman turned preacher who denied his Lord. And finally, we got Paul, the nerdy guy who used to persecute Christians before he became one. And Paul's the one who wrote this part of the Bible. So part of the issue in Corinth is that lots of people in the church wanted a more inspiring leader, someone tough and confident, a real winner, not like that loser Paul. What we think happened is that these people wrote a nasty letter to Paul, or maybe they just started talking about him behind his back. And in 2 Corinthians, he's re responding, he's defending himself. But he doesn't do it the way we would expect. He doesn't claim to be a winner. He doesn't claim to be Superman. He doesn't even say that he puts up a good fight. Instead, he starts bragging about all the bad stuff that has happened to him. Being hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. And that doesn't sound so good until you hear the context. Here's the quote. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed.
destroyed. Those but nots are really important. Paul and Timothy and whoever else is involved are not invulnerable. They are hurt by the attacks, the setbacks, their own fragility, but they are not destroyed by them. After all, Paul says in the famous verse, we have this treasure in jars of clay, that's us, to show that this all-surpassing power that is work in their ministry and in the churches is from God and not from us. We may be fragile, but we have something that is not fragile, all-surpassing power from God. Well, now we're talking. Based on that line, maybe you think we're headed back towards Superman. We're not. Verse 10 makes it clear. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Let me translate that for you. Inside our clay jars, inside our fragile bodies, we carry the fragility of Jesus. Jesus may have been all-powerful, but he became fragile. Jesus may have been strong, but he became weak. Jesus may have been immortal, but he was killed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. That's called incarnational ministry, my friends, as Jesus came to be with us. In that same way, we are with others. Just as Jesus risked persecution and death, so do Paul and Timothy risk it. Perhaps we could too. Perhaps at some level we should. What I love about this passage is that it doesn't let us take the cross, the crucifixion, the bloody body of Jesus, and consign them to one day, Good Friday. The death of Jesus is a living, active, present tense part of our faith. Paul says it in verse 11. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. You know, it's so easy for the world to believe wealthy, glamorous, beautiful people. And it's so tempting to buy into the world's narrative that winners win and losers lose. But Christianity says the opposite. When I lose, I win. When I am weak, I am strong. When I die, that is when I really start to live. That's the Easter message after all. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul will say this. The Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, says Paul, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. I'm reminded of something Jesus himself said in Luke 6. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man, because of Jesus. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Back to 2 Corinthians 4. Paul writes, I believed, therefore I have spoken. He's quoting a psalm. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we, you know, Paul and Timothy and the rest, know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you, people of the church, to himself, God. All's well that ends well. Treasure in clay jars. The all-surpassing power from God is in us, but not from us. It is of God. I think you have the general idea. 
But let me broaden the scope. There are more kinds of bodies. There's the body politic, there is a body of knowledge, and there is the body of Christ. As you know, the church is the body of Christ and each individual congregation a member of that body. So let's talk about congregations. I suppose we would all like to be in an indestructible megachurch led by Reverend Superman. But here we are, treasure in clay jars, fragile. We are fragile in so many ways. Some congregations are fragile about people, short on numbers, short on leaders. Some congregations are fragile with regard to money, not enough of it. Some congregations are fragile with regard to the burden of their church building. Boilers and roofs and everything else. They can be like black holes sucking the life out of everything. Some congregations will have more than one of these in play. Multiple fragility, if you will. The Elmwood Park congregation is short on people, and they have discerned that the faithful way to follow God's will is to close our church in November. I can't say often enough how much I respect the courage and faith it took to arrive at that decision. That is not the answer for every fragile church. Each congregation must candidly look at their situation and follow God's leadings. But I remind you of the words of Paul. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Closing, not closing, not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We have, my friends, treasure in clay jars. Feeling fragile is not a sign that we lack faith. It is not a sign that God has abandoned us. On the contrary, feeling fragile means that we are aware of the truth that we are mortal, that our true strength does not come from us, but from God. Think about this in terms of the church. We churches always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. And even in our weakness, we continue to reach out and show God's love to other people outside the church. That's called incarnational ministry, my friends. Jesus came to be with us. So in that way, same way, we are with others. We are mortal. These bodies we live in do have a span. So honestly, do churches. The average lifespan of a church is about the same as that for a human being, 80 years. And that, of course, includes churches that last a year and churches that last a thousand. But average 80. Being faithful to Christ does not take away risk. It means living into risk, the possibility of loss. It means not being paralyzed by risk and fear but carrying forward with bearing God's love and good news to the world regardless of our circumstances. Doing so reflects our faith, our courage, and our compassion. I close by repeating the last few verses of our passage for today. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Amen, my friends. Amen.